All right, today we're building these gigantic 16 foot doors out of tube steel, making the hinges from scratch and hanging them in my friend's studio. Check it out. So this project actually starts in the shop making the custom hinge. Now, you may have seen the video of this hinge on Instagram or Facebook. It went super viral and basically I'm just copying the idea of some gate hinges that I've used before. I ordered some steel tube and some steel bar from Online Metals that has about a 1,000th interference fit between the two. So I don't really have to do much crazy machining, but I did want to get a solid slug for the end of the tube so that it would, when I welded it in, it wouldn't have the opportunity to kind of bend. And you'll see the concept for this hinge in a second. But basically what I'm doing here is the steel bar gets welded to a plate and then that little slug that I'm turning down on the lathe gets welded inside the tube and then I'm using a inch and a quarter solid steel ball and that's going to actually be the roller that reduces the friction and allows the doors to pivot. These doors are going to be really large. They're about 16 feet tall and about four feet wide. So overall you're going to need something that's really substantial in order to actually make them pivot and not have a ton of resistance. Plus we don't want to lose any opening in the doorway when the doors are open so I didn't want to use a traditional hinge that would make the doorway smaller. For the base plate I'm using some half inch plate this is left over from another project and I just cut it up with the metal cutting circular saw and deburr the edges. Now I could only do so much when it came to actually making the hinges in the shop because while I did have a lot of really good field measurements I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do when I got there. So the plan was to make sort of a template for the hinges and then do the rest in the field uh, at the studio where I'm going to be installing and fabricating the doors. Now the stuff that I'm doing here though is critical to be done on a fixture table because I really need to make sure that the pin that I'm welding on stays perfectly square to the base plate uh, for both the top and the bottom hinge. So I grab a, my fine uh, mag drill and I drill a hole in the plate that I can plug weld this pin to once I weld it from the top as well. So I'm using my new Sigmund uh, 5x10 fixture table here and some fireball tool corner squares. And these are really nice because you can grab things kind of at that perfect perpendicular angle to a table in this case. Obviously I have everything clamped down nice and tight and I'm trying not to distort this pin so that it stays perfectly square to the base plate. If this pin even has a half a degree of angle to it with my friction fit and that really tight fit on all my parts, the doors are actually going to be able to bend. So like I said, I drilled that hole in the bottom so that I could plug weld the bottom of the pin as well. And this is going to just basically make sure that this thing never moves and it kept it really perfectly square. I was pretty impressed with the way this worked out and everything stayed really, really square and perpendicular. And then I could go ahead and make the top Oh, hinge uh, as well. Now inside the door is going to be the tube and this is going to get welded right inside the two inch tube material that we're building the doors out of and you'll see that a little bit later in the video but first I need to weld that slug that I turned down on the lathe into this so that the ball that I'm going to put in there has nowhere to go. Now some comments on the video on Instagram and Facebook were that the top of this tube is going to bend but this is like a one inch solid steel slug it's not going anywhere it's welded in it was beveled and penetrated and here you go you can see the way this hinge is going to work and it's going to work out really really well for these super heavy and really large doors so now let's go over to the studio this is the opening that we're going to be building the doors for it's a, a little bit taller than 16 feet up to that i-beam i think it's about nine feet wide now I got some really good field measurements and lucky for us there was sort of a mending plate already installed on the bottom of this beam. Now this is at my friend's uh, studio, they're an art fabricating company that I do a lot of work for and originally this was a factory kind of industrial space. So the beams that we're tying to are actually part of a kind of gantry crane system that's been out of service for a long time. Now we thought we could knock these bolts out and reuse them, but it turns out that uh, six of the eight of them were actually welded in from the top. So we got the nuts loose and then pulled down that plate so that we could use it basically as a template for the top of the hinge. Now my buddy Matt is here with me and he's actually a structural iron worker. So he came out to just sort of help me with this and make sure that I didn't mess anything up. And uh, this was a really fun project because it's not often that we get to do something like this on site. And it's just really fun to try to problem solve things like this. So here you can see we've got that pin hinge template, sort of the, the blank 
that I started with. And uh, while I'm doing some field measuring and working on the drawings, starting to cut up material, Matt was drilling all the holes so that we could bolt that into the ground. Now I'm using an Evolution miter saw here to cut all the tube. This is a great saw to bring on site. Normally I use my band saw in the shop as you've probably seen, but this saw is super fast and extremely accurate. It's great for cutting miters in both directions. And I've done a whole video on this if you're interested in a kind of one and done metal cutting saw that you can really do a lot of work with. So I just have it set up down on the floor and I'm cutting everything based on my drawing uh, that I showed earlier. Now I'm using a 360 degree kind of cross beam laser to line up the bottom pin and the top pin. So we set it basically where we want it to be and then Matt goes up in the lift and drops the tape measure down so that we can check everything, make sure that my tube and my field measurements are gonna work out with that half inch plate and the ball and all the different things that we kind of have to contend with. Now you notice in the drawing that I showed earlier, there's kind of like a transom that goes on top and that's because the doorway needs to be as wide as possible and we need to fill the gap above the doors and also have a place to tie in the hinge on one of the other sides. So the side that we started on where you had that mending plate, I don't have to worry about tying the hinge into it because the I-beam is already low enough. But on the other side, I need something to weld it to. So Matt gets to work fabricating up this sort of transom block and this is going to get welded up to the I-beam that's there so that we can tie both of the hinges into it. Now we also have to do some kind of field verification and make sure that everything stays nice and level. So we did have to compensate for about three quarters of an inch of drop in this beam, but uh, we did so with the tubes on the sides and everything wound up being perfectly level once we welded everything up. Now we also have to get a pin hinge here on the top. And like I said, we're gonna use the existing bolt holes. So we lined everything up using that laser and then we were able to just mark some kind of reference marks in the top of the plate and then use the original mending plate as a locator so that we could drill these holes on site. Now you can do a lot with a mag drill on site uh, and it's really great to have a tool like this. These holes are pretty large. I think we drilled them at 5 eighths and trying to do these with like a hand drill would have taken forever. So using a mag drill and an annular cutter is really what's going to help you do projects like this if it's something that you're interested in. Now we were definitely lucky that those bolts were long enough and they were in good enough shape that we could reuse them. They were actually three quarter inch bolts if I remember correctly. So we drilled seven eighths inch holes and once we got that pin bolted in, we were able to start fabricating the door. Now normally we would build a door like this on a fixture table if we could, but unfortunately they were so big we couldn't even build them in the shop and bring them here. So we had to build them all on the concrete floor. And while Matt started getting more material cut up, I started to prep for the way these actual pin hinge sleeves were going to slide into the plate themselves. And then we were able to do a test fit of the side of the door before we actually started welding stuff up. I wanted to make sure before we made a 200 plus pound door, it was definitely going to fit in the opening. So we just took that one piece, kind of did a mock up, made sure everything was going to fit. Matt went up on the lift and we had to slide everything in place with those bolts there just to make sure that everything was gonna work out once we started actually building the doors. I definitely think it's important to confirm something like this because it's obviously a lot harder to move a door than it is to just move a single piece of tube. So once we had that all verified, it was pretty straightforward fabricating this door uh, on the ground. Now I'm using these little 90 degree corner squares that are a quarter inch thick. Uh, these are from my buddy at Ollie Iron. I've shown these in a lot of videos in the past. Uh, and they're great, they're super lightweight. You can just kind of throw them under stuff. What's nice is they're all consistently a quarter inch thick so you can actually use them as spacers to get yourself off the ground if the floor has a, a kind of a wave in it. And we're just using kind of quick welding clamps to get all the corners. And then Matt and I verify that this thing is square by measuring diagonally. And if both of the diagonal measurements are equal, then you know that you have a square and 90 degree object. Now with that on the ground, Matt can start tacking stuff up. While Matt's working on that, I'm in the background of doing some more field verification. And then I'm also fabricating the other hinge and drilling the holes uh, that we know we need to drill while he's doing the welding. When it comes to putting the cross bracing, you'll notice that I want a continuous bar on the hinge side going down to the bottom of the hinge side of the door. And these are gonna have sort of an X pattern in them. So we just lay out the tube, mark it with a Sharpie. And then while Matt's welding, I'm cutting them up with the circular saw. 
Matt and I have worked together on projects for a number of years. Uh, we don't work together regularly at kind of our day jobs, but when we get to do projects like this, we basically kind of work in total synchronicity. We really don't even need to communicate that much because we kind of know where the person's going to be, know where the person's going to land next. And uh, we've definitely got a really good working relationship where we can get stuff done really efficiently. We started this project kind of midday on a Sunday and we got really far in just one day with just, you know, kind of what we had at our disposal. Welding and fabricating, working off field dimensions. Uh, you really need to kind of prep and work well with your partner if you're going to actually get stuff like this done in an efficient manner. So like I said, Matt's going to continue welding these up while we verify the next X brace. So the next brace, I'm going to use two pieces of materials that were cut off. And the goal here is to make this perfectly straight. So Matt sights it down and then I just mark everything once we get it into a nice spot that we like and I can cut everything with the circular saw and we can continue to weld. The metal cutting circular saw is such a critical tool for something like this. I'm able to cut through that two inch tube in one pass and uh, I'm actually a carpenter by trade prior to working with metal. So this feels very reminiscent of like cutting up framing material. Uh, if I had to do all this with a grinder, it would take 10 times as long and, and be so much more labor intensive. So by being able to make these really long sweeping miters with the circular saw, I can really work quickly and efficiently as though this was made out of wood. Once everything's cut and fabbed up, I just hold a few things in place for Matt while he tacks them. And then we can go ahead and continue to weld this whole thing. He's making sure that everything's nice and flat because these doors are going to get covered with sort of a plastic polycarbonate substrate once they're all done. To weld this, we're using a 215 MPI. It's a multi-process welder from Lincoln Electric, and the thing works really well, even on 110. We got a pretty long extension cord going, and it still did a great job. Now, I wanna have a grease fitting on the hinges, and the only way I could think to kind of fabricate this, then the best way I figured, was to actually drill and tap that sleeve and then leave an access hole in the side of the door so that that sleeve would have a little bit of float room if I had to adjust it. So I drilled a pretty large, I think it was an inch and a quarter hole with an annular cutter. And then I just made sure that it lined up where my Zerk fitting was gonna be on that sleeve. With that done, we could stand the door up and see how it fit for the first time. Now, like I said, Matt's a structural iron worker, so he's a little more used to kind of standing and lifting things into place with a scissor lift. So he's up on the lift and I'm on the ground kind of getting things in place. I'm taking a grease gun and greasing up that pin so that the hinge is really, really smooth grabbing the ball and getting everything set so that we can lift up the door and then put that bottom hinge plate in place. The doors are pretty heavy at a little bit over 200 pounds, but we're able to lift them together and get it dropped down. And then we have to do this sort of like kick out dance to get the, different, the two different hinges to line up with both the bolts on top and the marked out location on the bottom where the bottom hinge needs to land. You can see it pops right into place and you can kind of get the idea of just how large this opening is when you see Matt up on the lift and me and Eric down on the ground trying to line things up. With that in place, Matt can take some nuts and bolts and they can bolt this top hinge in place, which is just floating inside that sleeve. And then with that there, we lift the door up with a half inch spacer on top of the bottom plate. And right now the sleeve inside the door is still floating. So I have to knock it down into place to perfectly register against the ball bearing. And once it's down there, I can take the welder and I can weld through the holes that I drilled in the faces of the door uh, and just plug weld that hinge into place. At this point, the bottom plate is not bolted into the concrete yet, but it's wedged up against that, uh, that drywall. So it really has nowhere to go and we can kind of get an idea of the way the door operates. It's incredibly smooth uh, and I can basically stand on the door and ride it and it goes so well. I was super happy with the way that the ball bearing hinge worked out. And then I could just go ahead and drill some holes once I check and make sure everything's level. Now at 16 feet, even the slightest variance in this thing would have made it out of level. It's really easy to get out uh, when you're working at such a distance, but this thing stayed perfectly straight. And at this point in the day, it was about nine o'clock at night. We got the one door done and we were pretty happy with our progress. The last thing to do for this door was to drill and put in some anchors. I'm using these large Tapcon half inch anchors. I really like these. You set them with an impact gun um, and they really hold super well. You don't need to put drop in anchors in, uh, which wouldn't have really worked 
on this particular application. I needed to thread something in from the top down. Now the last thing we wanted to do on this day was to get the sort of transom welded in. With the door in place, we could get everything lined up and make sure that we were perfectly aligned with where the door was gonna close. So Matt started to weld it in once I did some grinding to get the paint off of that beam. And we were gonna stick weld this, but we didn't have the right size electrode. So Matt wound up just MIG welding it all in. And while he was working on that, I was continuing to work on the hinges and clean up the site so that we could get out of there for the night and I could come back and finish the second door another day. You can see the way we clamped everything to the transom just to make sure everything stayed nice and square. And it really did turn out awesome. Now I came back a couple days later by myself to work on the second door. Same process, I'm cutting everything up with the Evolution miter saw. And I know a little bit more this time than I did the first time as to where I need to kind of watch things. But it is different fabricating something like this alone while, uh, while Matt's not there. So like I said, same process on the ground using those Ollie iron squares, just getting everything clamped up. And this is sort of just like a good example workflow on how to do these kind of projects by yourself. You know, if you can have enough tools so that you don't have to, you know, jostle around clamps, I make sure that I bring enough that I don't have to do any resetting. And I'm just kind of working around, making sure that my two corners are perfect so that I know that my door is nice and square. It is definitely a little redundant when you're working alone because you have to double check things and you can't have someone hold the tape. So I've got a little squeezy clamp holding my tape measure, but I got my welder situated right in the center and then I can basically bounce around this door, get everything tacked, make sure it stays square and then manipulate it and move it around uh, to weld both sides. Now the doors start out pretty light, but they get heavy quickly, but I do want to make sure that I don't warp this. So you'll see it's constant checking to verify my dimensions and make sure that everything stays nice and square because you will notice if these doors have a sag in them uh, over this large distance. Especially knowing that the first door we made is perfectly level, I knew that if I made this door even the littlest bit crooked, it would be super noticeable. Now with the rectangular frame completed, I could start to work on the X frame. And you'll notice that I had to go the opposite direction on this one because I wanted to make sure again that my bottom of my diagonal was hitting the bottom of my hinge side. If you've ever built a gate, like a wooden gate, you know that you have to set your diagonal correctly, otherwise your gate will sag. You want that diagonal brace in constant tension uh, and by setting it correctly, you'll basically guarantee that the gate never sags. The, the wedge action that you're getting out of this diagonal brace it guarantees that it really can't go anywhere. And I wedged it right in the corner as well. So I have not only the weld holding it in place, but also just the rigidity of the material itself. I have to do a little bit of coping around the actual weld mint so that I can make sure everything fits nicely. But a couple of swipes with one of these CC grind robust grinding discs that I've talked about before gets everything basically obliterated in a couple seconds. With this set, I can continue to weld things and again, check my dimensions and make sure that my next diagonal is gonna fit nice. For this one, I didn't have to use offcuts because I had a continuous piece. So I was able to save myself the time of lining up two pieces, just mark everything with a Sharpie, pop it off, and then cut it with the metal cutting circular saw. For those that will ask, I'm using a Diablo Cermet 2 metal cutting blade. It's the same blade that I always use, the same blade that I talk about in all my videos where I use this tool. It's very good, you can get a couple of hundred cuts out of each one, but once they're dull, you need to just know when to give up because they really stop cutting uh, once those carbides start to wear out. So just always buy two so you have a backup. It's much easier to line up this cut because everything was marked on a continuous piece, but I still have to make sure that I get down on the ground and sight it and make sure that I fit everything with the grinder so that everything lines up really, really well. Checking it and looking at it by eye is honestly the most efficient way. The only other thing I could have done which would have been helpful was to run a string line. Now lucky for me, the door stood up on its side which helped with some of the welding and now I could just go through and basically weld up this entire door. I'm using uh, O35 wire and C25 gas. And like I said, this 215 MPI from Lincoln Electric is a great site welder. Uh, there is 220 here at this building, but it's a little hard to get to. So I did everything using a heavy 12 gauge extension cord and just ran this thing until I was done. It welded beautifully and handles this uh, 120 wall tube just super well. Now with the door welded up, I could drill for my plug welds for my hinges. 
And again, I'm using this mag drill. Uh, the cordless nature of this mag drill just makes it so versatile. And it's honestly one of the more expensive tools that I've bought for myself, just kind of knowing that I would need it. And it has made its money back time and time again. So two 5 8 plug weld holes in each of these tubes will allow me to weld in both of the hinges once everything is all set. Next task is to stand this door up and get ready to install it. Once I got it up on its side, there was just a little bit more welding to do and make sure that everything was all fitted up and I didn't leave any seams undone. When you have this many seams to weld, it's easy to forget or miss one or two and then find them later. But between you know welding everything, flipping it over, doing all the drilling, there was definitely a lot to do. Here's one shot of me actually putting in and threading, drilling and tapping one of the fittings inside the hinge. So you can see I'm using a quarter 28 tap there and just threading in a Zerk fitting. And that's what's gonna allow me to add some grease to the hinge. Now I made sure that that fitting was right where the ball would be. Uh, so the grease actually has somewhere to go. The fit that I have between the tube and the sleeve is so tight, there's really not much room for grease in there, but I wanna make sure that the actual ball itself gets plenty of grease on it uh, so it doesn't wear out as easily. And one more time, I have to drill that large inch and a quarter hole so that I have somewhere for the Zerk fitting to go when I slide that in. Here's a good shot of exactly what's happening. It gives me a little bit of room for adjustment, but still gonna allow me to get my grease gun on there. And last but not least, I have just a couple more holes to drill for the top hinge sleeve. Now what's nice about using a mag drill too is that even on 120 material, I can still get it to grab on its side and I can very easily drill a nice 5 8 hole. And I deburr that piece of tube and slide that in and plug weld it. Now when the video that I made of this went viral on Instagram and Facebook, people were saying that once I welded it, the tube would warp and the hinge would no longer work. Well, here's showing you that welding it did not make a difference. Uh, I was a little bit careful with my heat and I bounced around but look at how good that spins. Now again, that's the top hinge, so I don't have to worry about adding a ball there, but that really good fit is gonna make all the difference. All right. Now here I have to line up the second set of hinges and I don't have a solid wall to go up against here. So I actually used this little cart and I just floated my magnet uh, on my laser, uh, using the magnet on the laser to float it above and just line everything up with that X mark and then look up and transfer that to the bottom of my transom so that I can make sure that my top pin is in the exact same spot. Once again, I'm using the same welder, but this time I have to use it up on the lift. So I threw it up there, I strapped the bottle to the lift, and I was able to bring it up high with me using the extension cord so I could weld that top pin and hinge in place. Now I wanna just get this thing lined up as best as I can by eye. And then I throw one of these Bessie clamps on there to just keep it in place while I get ready to weld it. Now, you'll notice that there are holes and bolts in this. And the reason I did it this way versus just welding the hinge to the transom is if I ever need to take these doors down, I wanna be able to just take out hardware and remove the doors. I don't wanna to have to have to cut welds. So there's actually two pieces of plate up there. And now you can see it a little bit better. The top plate is welded to the transom and the bottom plate is on the hinge. So now Eric, who is one of the owners of the studio, helped me out with standing up this door. We just basically slid it in place and I learned from Matt when we did the first door uh, how to do this with the scissor lift. In my normal everyday life, I don't operate a scissor lift. It's not something that I normally do. I'm not a structural guy in this way, but uh, it's fun every now and then to get up high and especially do some work like this, do some welding up high and some grinding. Uh, and it always keeps you on your toes while letting that scissor lift kind of wiggle around when you're 16 feet up in the air. Now I'm clamping and checking everything, making sure that my spacing is really good and just verifying that everything's gonna look nice before I go ahead and start welding that hinge into place. Right now we're working on everything being kind of, you know, temped up, uh, but then I can go ahead and just drill out those holes. I had to do a little bit of correction for alignment and then I could fully weld everything and you can see how nice these doors are starting to look. Now this sort of plastic wall is just a barrier in between uh, two sections of this studio. And I was careful to make sure I didn't melt it, but it was kind of hard to do all this welding up there next to this sheet of plastic. While I was doing that, Eric was down below with the fire extinguisher just in case anything caught up. 
Now I have to fill in those plug welds on the bottom and you can see I already set one of my tap cons, uh, but welding those plug welds did not distort the tube at all. And this door actually worked even better than the other one. Now the only issue we had here was the floor was a little bit out of level, so the door is sitting a little bit lower. We have some kind of thoughts on how to correct this, but for now I put four tap cons in the rear and this is basically done. Last thing to do was throw some grease in that grease fitting and you can see how nicely that worked there. And these gigantic doors that we made on site in about a day and a half are finished. I think they came out super nice. I really love the way they look. And the vision for this was to follow along with some of the design elements in the rest of their studio, which is this kind of opaque polycarbonate. And Serena and Eric wrapped those after we left and put these aluminum straps in between as kind of branches between the two. And I really think that the doors came out awesome. They move beautifully and they really just beautifully divide their space. And I'm so happy with the way they turned out.